All right, everybody, we're going to continue now with notes for chapter two, and we're going to kick things off in this portion of the video with section four, audience targeting. Trying to reach an ideal demographic can result in the loss of a mass audience. A couple examples here, the gender gap. If you're trying to reach out to men, you might wind up losing a lot of women because men and women by and large, think differently. Same thing if you're going for a more liberal mindset versus a more conservative mindset, choosing one or the other may cause you to lose a good portion of your audience. These days, that winds up being pretty much 50-50. The struggle between advertisers and networks concerning what audiences to target and when Sometimes what the advertiser wants isn't necessarily exactly who the network is reaching out to. And there are times that advertising clients have influenced the content of programming because they're trying to reach a certain demographic. Now, we've talked a lot about demographics, breaking up the population based on certain uh, macro categories, things like uh, gender, age, race, geography, but we can get even more particular than that, and that's through something called psychographics. Psychographics involves using lifestyle data, and it targets more directly than just those different things that we talk about in demographics. So you can get as detailed as you want. Uh, where you can go from, say, younger people that like heavy metal music to middle-aged people that have a lot of money that are politically active. There's all sorts of different categories. If you can think of a way to categorize a small section of the population, there's a psychographic for it. Networks try to create program schedules that attract its target's audience and keeps them from show to show. Uh, so in the way that networks schedule their lineups, they're trying to reach a certain segment of the population and they want to reach out to them and keep them for as long as they possibly can. Let's take a look now at some classic scheduling strategies. There's several here that uh, are used in different ways and different means for different purposes. First one we're going to look at is called anchoring. This is the idea of having a strong lead-off program. So your prime time schedule in this case starting off with a strong show and generally the first prime time show sets the tone for the network's entire evening. You'll notice that as you tune into various networks that one night of the week they're strong in sitcoms. One night of the week they're strong in reality programming. One night of the week they're strong in dramas, certain types of dramas. The first show of the evening is generally going to set the stage for the type of audience that is being attracted for the entire scope of of the evening. That's what the anchoring strategy does. The lead-in strategy, placing a stronger series before a weaker or a new in uh, or, or a new series rather. Uh, in a way this is kind of like the anchoring strategy except you might have uh, say say the nine o'clock hour. Uh, you may place a weaker show at 9:30 after a stronger show at 9 o'clock in hopes that people will stay tuned in for the entire hour. Hammocking is the idea that a possible audience sag in the middle will be offset, offset rather by strong programming before and after it. Kind of a different twist on the lead-in strategy in that you have a strong show at 9 o'clock, you have a strong show at 10 o'clock, those shows possibly related or at least trying to keep the same type of demographic or psychographic. So the show that's hammocked in the middle will hopefully by, be supported by 
both stronger shows on either side of it. The blocking strategy, placing a new program within a set of similar programs, this is also called stacking. So you may, in this particular strategy, see a sitcom placed with other sitcoms, a drama of a certain type placed with similar types of dramas. Programming will tend to skew more towards older audiences as the evening goes on. This is something to keep in mind as well. You know, children go to bed at a certain time in the evening. Teenagers go to bed at a certain time in the evening. So as the evening goes along, your average age of your audience is getting older and older and older. So that's something else that programmers are keeping in mind with putting together their primetime lineups. Some possible pitfalls of blocking. Well, a few issues here. A new program might not have the staying power that it needs. And if that's the case, it'll lose its ratings and the ratings of the show that follows it. Because, again, think about tuning inertia. Uh, people may not be as quick to come back to a channel that they've turned away from if they're getting engaged in a show on that other channel. Too much of one thing can cause audiences to grow tired of the genre. So if all you're doing is running various uh, crime dramas in one evening and possibly various incarnations of the same drama, you know, there's a, you know, the joke about how many different flavors of law and order there are out there. Uh, how many different NCIS programs are out there. Uh, in the early 2000s, it was CSI. Uh, is there such a thing as too much of a good thing, and can it ruin it? Also, shows that get too popular can rise the cost of production. So putting all of your investment into a popular show that is very expensive to actually keep on the air could wind up being a detriment for the network as well. Let's move on with some other strategies. Doubling. Doubling is the airing of different episodes of the same program back to back. Now, so this would be the case. Uh, this is popular, especially with 30 minute shows, uh, a lot of sitcoms, uh, sometimes game shows where you'll air that particular program at eight o'clock and then you'll run a different episode of the same program at 830. Now this runs the danger of a show going in the rerun sooner because you may not you might not have the inventory to be able to keep things fresh and new. Sometimes a rerun will air before a new episode. So perhaps on week one you run a new episode. Week two you run the week one program before running the new week two program, and on and on and on. And sometimes shows will be stripped across multiple days, kind of like a mini series. So this would be a strategy of every night this week at eight o'clock, catch a new episode of such and such a show. Doubling works in that way as well. The linchpin strategy is when a network focuses on a central strong show on week evenings. This is also called tent pulling. So you may have a very popular show that airs at nine o'clock, for example. And you put that there in hopes that your shows that aren't doing as well in the eight o'clock hour and the 10 o'clock hour might get strengthened by people that are tuning in for the nine o'clock show. Okay, moving on. Bridging. There's three different variations of the bridging strategy. One is in which long-form programming would start prior to the beginning of official prime time. Uh, this is done a lot on PBS stations and with uh, premium services like HBO. So you might have a longer program that runs longer than an hour, but you start airing that program at 7 o'clock or at 7.30 so that the end of the show runs into prime time. And that's in hopes of people turning into your show and staying with your show into those prime time hours, which works against the other networks out there. 
Another aspect of bridging would be starting or ending programs at unusual times. In the early days of TBS, they tend to uh, they tended to start their programs at five minutes past the hour and 35 minutes past the hour. And that was so that people would continue to watch the program in its entirety and it would cross past those normal start times of top of hour, bottom of hour, uh, in hopes that people will stay tuned in to TBS. Also, during football season, programming on CBS is done in this sort of way where they air all of their shows in, in, the, in their entirety after the end of football. So 60 Minutes, which is slated to start at 7 p.m., might not start until quarter past 7 or 7.40 or whatever time that football finishes up and they continue running its entire lineup in its entirety, just time delayed. A third way bridging works is that they air half-hour shows against a competitor's hour-long shows. So in that way, there's hopes that uh, viewers will stay tuned in to that network instead of jumping to another channel halfway into a show. The countering strategy is offering a program that has a completely different appeal from the competition. And this challenges the idea of the ideal demographic. So this strategy says, well, my competition is airing a show that attracts uh, a strong male audience. We're going to put programming on at the same time that's going to attract a strong female audience. That's countering. Blunting is scheduling a show that has an identical appeal to that of the competition. So you're going head-to-head -head with the, your competition in this aspect. Uh, if your competition is running a certain type of crime show, you may run a different type of crime show that appeals to the same uh, demographic, or you might air a different type of show altogether that appeals to the same demographic and they have to choose between watching the crime drama and watching the show that you're offering. Now, if two networks are blunting, a third that is counter-programming may wind up winning that time slot because that third network is going after a completely demographic. They're not trying to split the audience with the competition. Stunting is a strategy that's involving making a last-minute change in the schedule. Uh, this can take on different ways of manifesting itself. Uh, you might air a special, have a guest star. Uh, you could incorporate unusual types of promotion. Um, sports events, concerts, all of that can uh, fall into the category of stunting. Um, and they've had various in, uh, varying rather forms of success in doing those sorts of things. Supersizing is a type of stunting that features the lengthening of a program as a special episode. Uh, you see this a lot with comedies in particular, especially half-hour sitcoms, that perhaps in the period of two hours, instead of airing four 30-minute sitcoms, you might air three 40-minute sitcoms. The seamless strategy is the idea of ending one program and then immediately starting the next without a commercial break in between. Most of the networks are using this strategy nowadays. In other words, uh, when the credits are rolling on program A, as soon as they're done, boom, you're in the beginning of program B. Also, sometimes they don't even bother airing the credits. They'll take them and kind of make them as reduced graphics. Most of the networks are doing this as well. Uh, and sometimes they'll even air the credits in the beginning of the show uh, in much smaller print to, for lack of better terminology, get it out of the way and include more programming content as those credits are rolling to keep the viewer tuned in. 
Rotating is having various shows running in the, tame, uh, in the same time slot. Usually they have a more popular show running during sweeps periods. So you may find that uh, a certain day a week that uh, there's different shows that are running in a certain time slot trying to either capture the attention of a wide variety of audiences or run several types of shows that would appeal to one particular type of audience. Uh, a good example of this would be uh, on PBS, shows like Masterpiece Theater, uh, that the show isn't necessarily a series where you've got the same characters and, and the same storyline going on week after week, that you've got different one-offs that are running under that umbrella of Masterpiece Theater. So you don't necessarily know what you're going to get week after week in terms of storyline or in terms of actors and actresses, but you know you're going to get a general type of show that people look for from Masterpiece Theater. Strip Sampling is a new series that is aired on several different nights and sometimes on different networks as well. So this strategy would involve, say, airing a new show Monday night on uh, NBC and then on Tuesday night either airing the very same episode or airing a different episode of that show on USA Network or on Universal Network in order to create interest in the show but also create interest in the different networks that that company owns. Let's talk about appointment viewing. The idea that viewers plan their day around being able to watch their favorite programs. That's what we call appointment viewing. Uh, very much something that happened prior to the advent of the VCR and the DVR and watching things on demand. If your favorite show was on Tuesday night at 8 o'clock, you made sure you were home Tuesday night at 8 o'clock to watch your favorite show. This presented a very different view of uh, habit, uh, excuse me, this presented a very different view of habitual viewing, which had always been assumed to be a factor in channel or network loyalty. Overall, this is diminishing, though, again, because of things like on-demand and DVRs and e even reruns kind of taken away from the idea of appointment viewing because the idea of, oh, I can watch this again on this other channel at this other time. Understanding that people were loyal to programs and not to networks gave networks the sense of seeing the value in the programming itself as a potential revenue stream. Uh, so the original thought was when it was just the big three networks that you could throw pretty much anything on the air, but people were going to be loyal to watching one particular network, like they were an ABC family or a CBS family. Uh, and it was actually kind of a novel concept for them to realize that people liked particular shows as opposed to particular networks. So once they realized that, and the advent of VHS tapes and DVDs and all that came about, they realized that, hey, maybe if people liked these shows enough, they would buy them and own them. So it created an opportunity for increased revenue to come to the networks by selling these various shows. All right, let's talk about ratings now. Commercial spot costs depend mainly on the absolute ratings plus three days. So this is a way of measuring the total estimated audience. You're measuring the audience that actually watched the show on the network at the time that it aired. And this is also accounting for people that DVR the show and watch it later, which ratings are also reported for. Uh, people that watch shows on various streaming services uh, a day or two after they air, those are counted. Uh, so once they get the total ratings of all those things, they're able to set advertising rates based on the ratings that they got for that particular show. Ratings lack precision, however. 
Some 12,000 cooperating families represent all of the U.S. sampling from which ratings are estimated, the Nielsen families. Uh, so those families are measured, what they're watching, when they're watching it, how they're watching it, and they're by and large speaking for the entire population. Some other factors in ratings, sweeps and overnights. Sweeps is the concept that four times a year, Nielsen collects data on viewing habits that is converted into ratings, shares, and demographic information. These tend to happen uh, at the same times every year. November and February and May and uh, I believe uh, July is the other one. Uh, but during these sweeps periods, what you're going to find is that uh, networks, television stations are going to be airing all sorts of different types of programming, special features within their regular programming, uh, some of the other types of shows where they try to really capture your attention and get you to tune in because they want those eyeballs on their network so that they can count up their ratings points and set their advertising rates. Overnight ratings are numbers calculated overnight to monitor overall urban audience reaction. This is used to make predictions about programs. So this is how they're very preliminary reports, but they're able to gauge uh, in a rather simplified fashion how many people were tuned into a particular show or a particular network the night before and it's able to give a bit of an indication as to how popular or unpopular a particular show is. Some other factors that make a show successful include international appeal. Shows that uh, may not necessarily have been popular in the United States but did catch uh, a good bit of popularity in Europe and other parts of the world. The high value of the concept of a show. Uh, so the American version of Big Brother doesn't air around the world, but the idea of the show is sold to production companies throughout the world and they do their own versions of Big Brother. This is also a very popular concept with other reality shows and with game shows. Also, the appeal to special interests. This is where we get into the DVD sales, the reruns on cable in particular. Uh, that if you find that loyal niche market for something, that people with that loyalty might be willing to spend their money and spend their time consuming that content and purchasing that content. Some other reports of interest, including the Pocket Piece Report. This is uh, where you get data based on Nielsen data, ratings, shares, households, all that sort of thing. And there's an example of this in your textbook. The MNA, the Multi-Network Area Report, is a report in which data is compiled from 70 leading population centers. This includes demographic data that helps to give a little bit of detailed information to some of the ratings numbers that are provided. And these are just a sampling of the different types of reports that Nielsen and other companies, but mostly Nielsen, uh, are involved in providing to television stations and to networks. And we'll talk more about those in particular as we go on in the course. Right now, though, we're going to go ahead and break, and to continue with the notes for Chapter 2, check out the video labeled Part C.